Our mission is to bring together the best venture capitalists to compete so you have the insights on how to invest with the best. We've got these wonderful VC panelists, right? We're going to be talking about a few things in the news and investing and strategies and uh, what they're looking for in startups. And after every question, we're going to put up a QR code, which is uh, to slide out, and you're going to have the ability to vote on who wins each question. Two VCs will make it to the finals, and the winner will be awarded this beautiful primetime VC belt, right? So that's beautiful. Are you excited? Are you all excited or nervous? I don't know. Why don't we just start off, warm it up a little bit. Why don't you introduce yourself, your fund, you know, a minute, a little intro. We'll, start, we'll just go right down the line. For sure. So, hi, everybody. I'm Alana Dickman. Also on social, I'm known as Trading Female. I'm a partner at Redbeard Ventures. We're a Web3 and crypto-focused VC. Uh, so we actually started as a syndicate. Uh, we made over 150 investments to date out of the syndicate. Um, stage agnostic. We've invested in Sandbox, Dapper Labs, Wilder World, Super Rare, Zed Run, and I'm not going to name all 150 for you. And then a year ago, we started raising the fund. So we're a pre-seed, seed, stage fund that invests in Web3 and crypto. And then on the side, I'm the founder of the Girls Table, which is used to highlight voices um, of both women and men, entrepreneur, creators, and investors. So happy to be here today, and thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Megan Ananian. I am currently a venture fellow at a firm called Hatsimo's Libby HL Ventures here in the city. Uh, I spent the last two years raising a fund for female founders in deep tech called The Helm. Um, and now I'm doing a lot of consulting for other emerging fund managers that are looking to raise funds. Hi everyone, Pete Mathias. I'm with Alumni Ventures. We are a generalist fund. I say journey partners, which is another way of saying we can be with you from inception of the company, seed to, to growth. And we're one of the most active funds out there. So when you're interviewing your investors and you ask them, what are you bringing to the table beyond capital? Alumni Ventures, it's easier to, to answer. We have an extraordinary network of LPs, I think almost 10,000 at this point. So very, very active. Prior to being a venture investor, I was touring drummer. So there's the front door to get into venture. And then there's the back door. I definitely took the back door, but I absolutely love being around entrepreneurs. So I feel like it's my calling. Absolutely. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Saka Nuru. I am an emerging venture capitalist at Funder VC. Uh, I was an operator for about eight years working at various tech companies and uh, sold a bunch of my shares to start angel investing, and I got absolutely hooked. I started doing that, uh, hit a few home runs, and decided to raise my own fund, uh, leveraging my experience as an operator. So in short, founders can't BS me, because I've been there before. Uh, excited to be here, thanks for having us, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the show. All right, guys, okay, let's just start it off. Uh, we're gonna start off with a macro question, holistic view here, what's going on with startup funding? Q1 is 46% down from the year before. Uh, we've, we're, told, we're all told there's capital, but no one's really seeing it right now. So what is the mindset of a VC at the moment in the market, and what are the metrics most important to a VC? Megan, I'm going to give it to you to start it off. Yeah, I think nobody likes the answer to this question because everyone's talking about profitability versus um, users and other ways to generate demand in the past. But I would say really the most important thing right now is looking at burn. When I look at companies that have, are raising five million and they just burned through four million in the last nine months, that concerns me. So I think a lot of your funders are gonna look for 18 to 24 months of burn. So even if you're not gonna hit profitability in the next couple of years, you can at least sustain yourself for the next two years. We don't really know what the market's gonna be. Um, but I do think everyone's eager, especially coming out of this post SVB world, to do some deals. So there's a lot of big funds that are still crossover funds sitting on the sidelines, but hang out with your emerging funds. Emerging funds are eager to do deals right now. Alana? Uh, yeah, and I think that's definitely a good point. Uh, for us, so we actually did slow down our deployment in Q4. I don't wanna say that because I'm trying to win that belt right now. 
<laughs> but it's true. Like we slowed it down. We looked at our fund. We looked at the valuations that we were getting and we realized that they were a lot higher than what we initially thought when we started the fund and where we wanted them to be. So what we had to do as a fund is we had to say, okay, how do we get bigger ownership percentages and lower valuations? And we're not saying this just because we want bigger ownership to return the fund, but for a lot of actual founders out there, the valuations that they were getting just didn't make sense. Like a seed stage, $200 million valuation, haven't launched yet, they have a PowerPoint. Like it doesn't make sense for anybody because when they go out to raise their Series A, one, they're not able to, they already spent too much burn and it just, they're gonna have to do a down round. And so for us, it's working with the founders to have an actual valuation that makes sense for everybody. So we're still actively deploying capital. I think we took time to slow down and I think most people are ready to continue to invest and find founders that they believe in. And I don't think it's this hype cycle that you're trying to be another VC at a valuation so it just keeps getting higher and higher. But you're able to, as a VC, take your time and diligence, find companies that really excite you and then invest in those companies. Very nice. Pete, what's your mindset? What are the metrics? First, I I've sat there before and scribbled down notes about what a venture investor thinks you should do and where you should be and <laughs> milestones that I need to achieve. And if I get them, it's great. Be careful of that. Discount what I'm about to say because every venture investor varies big time. I'll offer three. First is tempo. As I said, I'm a drummer. I'll, I'll get back to that, but tempo. Second, Megan, I totally agree with you. Capital efficiency, it's a big one. And then lastly, it's underappreciated but it's talked about a lot, founder market fit. So tempo, timing, there's a big difference between a company that's hit their big milestone, whether it's 10,000 users or $10,000, and done it in a month versus a year. So tempo matters, timing matters. Throw it in your deck, always include some, some bit of timing. Capital efficiency, burn, that's, a, that's kind of a nebulous um, thing for investors to look at. Um, but for me, it's actually very specific. There's a critical ratio. Uh, how much money have you raised versus what outcomes have you produced? And so capital, capital efficiency. And then lastly, founder market fit. I think the days, I think the days of investors backing founders that don't have a domain expertise or don't have a track record in that space are uh, over for now. For example, I come from entertainment. If I want to take on the healthcare space, um, that's a that's a tougher that's a tougher conversion. Investors don't want to subsidize learning. Um, so those are the big three in, in my mind. Saga. Yeah, uh, I'd agree with a lot of that. However, I'd say when it comes to burn, it's not just runway and how much you're spending and how much time that gives you. It's about how much are you spending per ARR dollar that comes in, right? So it's about putting that burn multiple in context. The second thing I'd say is net dollar retention is really important, right? Um, so is it above 100%? So in, in other words, are your existing customers staying with you and are they spending more money with you on a yearly basis? Because customers are hard to come by. And actually that leads into my third point, which is churn rates as well. It's hard to find customers and get them into the door. People spend millions just running ads and trying to get people in, but then they just churn out from the end of the bucket. You know, it's like a leaky bucket. So keeping those customers and being conscious of your churn rate is gonna be super important because the last thing you wanna do is spend your precious dollars that you've gone to VCs for um, acquiring new customers because that's expensive. Focus on keeping your existing customers and expanding product lines for them during this downturn. And over time, once we're back into the heyday of VC or founder land, so, so to speak, um, then you can start to look at other things. But uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. That was a nice little warm up round. We're gonna bring up the QR code. Just we're gonna we're gonna practice this little exercise here. QR code right there. Scan that QR code. That brings you to Slido, and you can vote on who won this very pleasant, nice round. Everybody was all nice. There's no disagreements. We're gonna debate next. Next question. That's all right. But is there anything else that we missed while they everybody's voting that you maybe want to steal? The, the question or the round before? No, I just feel like I'm on Survivor. You know that show? You are. It's like, yeah, you're all the Survivor. <laughs> Alana, you, you look like you had something to say, no? Do I have something to say? I mean, I always have something to say, but. We have like 30 seconds or so before oh, we close out the votes. So, so steal it. I wasn't nervous before. Now I'm like, what do I say? Well, um, no, go on. No, no, you go ahead. No, I had something to say on the former point. So we talked about metrics, but earlier on, I think 
the state of VC d differs b based on whether you're an emerging manager or an existing uh, fund. So things are down 46%, 50%, but if you are an LP or your VC that has $100 million to deploy, this dip means there's a great opportunity to invest in startups with lower valuations. If you're an emerging manager like me, this dip means, oh man, my LPs might not be funding my VCs or taking risk on new emerging well, managers. The job's the same, right? What's, what do you mean? By the way, we talked about disagreement beforehand, mm. but the job's the same. I mean, your job, whether you're an EM or an established fund, is, is to turn a dollar into something. Oh yeah, but if you have 100 million in dry powder versus 50K, that's a very different. And you always have a three year deployment period, but the big funds can sit on it because it doesn't matter when they raise their next fund. For, but emerging funds have to be back in market in three years. Exactly, yeah. Let's see who won the round, Nadal. Do you mind uh, bringing up the Slido results? I mean, it's suspense right now. Oh, we have 11 votes, and it doesn't look like it's working. There we go. A tie. Damn. We don't do ties here. There's only one belt. So what happens? Do we fight to the death, or like what, what happens? <laughs> there we go. Sokka won the first round, and we're going to move on. We're, oh, yep. Sokka won the first round. This is a cumulative vote, so... It's not like he wins the first round. So just keep sending in these votes as we go on, and then we're going to move on to the next round. Uh, all right, second question, a debate question. We're going to make you go against each other. Okay. And you could take down the QR code. Nadal, thank you very much. Second question, buy or sell? Uh, it's NFT NYC week. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but it seems like Web3 is making a comeback as the most exciting vertical to invest in. Do you buy or sell this? It's a TRF question, right? True or false? But well, uh, and if you don't agree with this, what verticals excite you, and what are the unicorns in it? So, uh, naturally, Elena. Yeah. So first off, I'm kind of just curious because it's NFT New York City. How many people in the audience are in Web three crypto? Then I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's smart. <laughs> Um, but personally, I'm a Web3 crypto fund, so naturally, I believe in the future of Web3 and crypto. Um, I wouldn't say I'm just buying and selling. I'm definitely in the long-term play. If you guys didn't see, each just went above $2,000 for the first time in like a year, so that was exciting. But what excites me the most specifically is there's kind of two sectors that I like, and one is we invest in equity and tokens. So. Tokens is probably, I think, personally, the most exciting part about Web3. Because if people nail tokens and incentivize either usage or ownership rights, then that's going to be huge. And a great example of this is probably the token that even Starbucks gave out to their most loyal customers. So you go in. They didn't have to say NFTs, but they did. You got this NFT. Now they're actually incentivizing you to go to their store, to spend money, to refer other friends. But then the best part is you actually own that. So now you could actually sell it. And I'm a big Starbucks person. So like naturally if I have the highest thing and somebody's willing to spend $500 because they want that, I'm like, sure, go ahead. I'll just go spend the $500 at Starbucks. And so I think that's really important. And that's just a stupid example. But um, also kind of the last part about tokens is it's another exit for VCs. So you have obviously if a company goes IPO, or if they get acquired. But then that last part is if they have a token and that actually goes ICO. And we're already seeing that where we're having multiples on some of our investments of 5X, of 10X in hopes that we've only been around for a year, but eventually those will be 100X. And you're not seeing that many companies go public nowadays. So by having that token, I think it's really exciting for us. I think we need a primetime VC token, but we'll get there. Uh, Pete, is it Web3 that excites you the most or which vertical and where is the unicorn? So shout out to my three NFT NYC attendees. I, I am a true believer. I, I have, in my music days, we we're selling our music for Bitcoin back in 2012. I'm with you. For me, there's, there's two types of investments though. There's ones that have intuitive markets and there's ones that do not. Intuitive markets means when you hear about them, you don't scratch your head and wonder, you know, who's gonna pay for that or how much, uh, what is the TAM? You don't question it. Web3 right now is still in this stasis of non-intuitiveness. And that that leads me to say I'm, I'm focusing more on timeless and universal pillars of 
community of country uh, give you a flavor for one. Um, you asked about a unicorn. Um, future of work. The, the industrial revolution at this point produced one big piece of software, which was the org chart. We all are at companies, organizations. The org chart is pretty outdated. And I think that was put on trial, mostly during the pandemic. The org chart is virtually um, redundant, even irrelevant. So there's a very cool company. I'm not an investor in the company. I'm not going to sell you on the companies that, I'm a, that are portfolio companies. Is, is one called Gloat. And Gloat is really reimagining what, uh, what powers a workforce. So to me, that's a more intuitive one. Um, sectors like healthcare, energy, infrastructure, defense, cybersecurity, these are things that touch timeless needs and, and big, big spend. So that's where I see the unicorns. But again, I'm overall long on, on Web3. Soccer, what do you got? Uh, Web3, buying on that, or you got a different vertical? Yeah, no, I think Web3 is, uh, is very promising, but I like to work backwards and reverse engineer it from the value proposition of Web3. Web3 is there because it differs from Web2 in the fact that the users of a platform will also accrue the value from that platform, unlike LinkedIn, other social media platforms where the shareholders accrue all the value from that platform, but the users don't necessarily you know, accrue that value. So when I think of that being the value proposition of Web3, I look at what verticals or sectors are ripe for dis disruption based on that particular use case to make it more concrete. Think of sectors where there is a bottleneck, um, where there are a large amount of users and none of them are accumulating value from that network. And that's a frustration for them. Think of the event space, Ticketmaster, right? They're like a monopoly. Everyone has to go there for their tickets. The fees are extortionate. It's a community because we all listen to music, got my drummer next to me. You know, everyone's in that space, but then it's a monopoly. So I think that's ripe for disruption because people want to be part of that community, but also accrue value from that community at the same time. That can be applied to social media, as I mentioned. I think events are really interesting. Gaming is huge, especially because there's this in innate need and, sh and desire to share within themselves. So tokens and things of that nature, I think will be part of that. But gaming is bigger than music and movies combined in terms of dollar value. So I think there's huge opportunity there um, for, for disruption. So anyway, I reverse engineered it. I hope that thesis works and we'll see if it plays out. You got a unicorn you want to shout out real quick? Uh, I don't have a specific one, to be honest. Got to have one. <laughs> I, I don't need to have one. Um, I have a hypothesis. And so I'm sticking with that. And if it works out, Give me the kudos, and if it doesn't, blame this guy. All right, but your job is to pick companies, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? That's I right. Mean, it's know. right, Megan. You could sort steal of hedge this. there, Megan. This is for you to steal. Uh, so I worked at Circle four years ago, and we worked on tokenized security offerings for a long time. We were a broker dealer registered with the SEC. The SEC commissioner was always in our office. You guys know what the moral of the story was: tokenized security offerings did not get off the ground. So all this is to say. We even had an allocation of Dapper Labs in 2019 that we were going to ICO, like, ugh. But I'm long Web3, I'm long blockchain, obviously. I'm long tokenized securities. There was a lot of noise that came out last year, 2021. I mean, our NFT NYC, even 2022, like, people were just building products for what I like to call vitamins versus a pill, like a painkiller. So this would be a nice to have, and you're raising at a 50 to $100 million valuation for a pre-revenue product. I think there was a lot of hype and craze, and I didn't make any investments because it was insane. <laughs> and I'm ready for it to be the time where it currently is, where the people that are building for the long run are here and raising at more reasonable valuations. <laughs> um, so all of this is to say I'm really long on climate tech. Climate tech's gonna be my thing. It's Y'all, aggregated demand is already built in. If we can get to price parity for the same products that people are already using and we just give them a climate friendly version, like an alternative to plastic or all things electric versus oil and gas, it's just, it's so easy. It's not a vitamin versus a painkiller. It's just like, okay, for the same price, yeah, I'll choose that one. So I'm long on climate. I have a question. Do you use paper straws? <laughs> paper straws are not hitting. We, we got to find a different the right answer. It's the right answer. Right answer. <laughs> I've got a question. Straws. Do you have any bored apes or no? 
I do not have any board apes, but I have like 15 NFTs. Voting has started. Is that a flex? No, I don't have any. That was a flex. No, I was not going to spend a million dollars on a picture of an ape. Do I look No, thank you. (laughs) A picture of a lion, maybe, but not an ape, yeah. I would like an NFT. If anybody wants to transfer an NFT, I'm I'm willing to take an NFT from anybody. Uh, Question two, we have uh, the voting up, so make your votes. If you guys want to scan the QR code and put some votes in, too, you could do that. (laughs) It's fine. Um, but any, did we miss anything? Do any other shout outs to unicorns while the voting is coming in? Yeah, I didn't hear too many shout outs to, to unicorns. It, clarification that does do the portfolio companies, uh, does that count? You could do a portfolio company if you believe in them. Do you believe in them? I believe in all my <laughs> I invested in a company called Venus Aerospace. It's run by a, Ooh, a that's woman husband. Syndicate. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> uh, the woman husband team, Sassy Dougalby. She's the best. Uh, she was raising her seed round a couple years ago, and they're trying to do a hypersonic flight one hour from Tokyo to LA, and uh, they're going to do it. And I'm super jazzed to see what how amazing that is going to make the world in 2030. I'll do one. Uh, what we did was get protocol. We're talking. We have a drummer. We were talking about ticketing, and they're working with the biggest sports teams in Europe. And so eventually, I do think Ticketmaster would be disrupted, and it, you'll be able to buy a secondary ticket and that will actually go back to the artist, the fees, as opposed to just a big company like Ticketmaster taking it. So that's when I'm pretty Taylor excited Taylor Swift took, almost took down Ticketmaster too, I know, right? I wish I got a ticket. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, do you want to put up the results here? I hope, hopefully we got some good results here. Here we go, 27, good activity here. Good job, crowd. Sock is coming away with the win again? All right. Oh, wow. Look at Cheers. that. Yeah. Look at that. He must have been paying people off in the crowd, but it's all right. He's got some good, wink, good answers. Wink, you know. Again, cumulative vote here. So um looks like Alana is in the second. So you're, you're doing quite well. And, and and I didn't mention, not to make things awkward, if you don't make the finals, you got to get out of the seat in the middle and be on the outside. Just let everybody know, all right? Center stage, finalist, center stage. All right. Next question. Three. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the news. There's a guy named Elon Musk, and he's in the news again, all right? So Elon Musk is in the news. He's uh, shocking. Yes, shadow banning some Substack uh, links. He is um, he's in the news for a lot of things, right? But uh, particularly this feud with Substack, which is pretty interesting. Uh, meanwhile, Jack Dorsey has a new company called Blue Sky. If anybody has a Blue Sky invite, I would like one. Please, do you have one? I don't know. Just That's shameless. Let me get a Blue Sky invite. Thank you. Um, the, the question, right, bringing it back, bringing it back. Uh, how do you advise your portfolio companies in dealing with their competitors? And Pete, why don't you kick it off here? Competitors. It, if the railroads had thought that they were actually in competition with cars and planes, we'd probably have better railroads today, but they actually thought they were in competition with other railroads. I think a lot of a lot of founders perceive competition in their immediate peers when in fact they're probably complementers, they're probably partners. So I was talking to some Web3 entrepreneurs just before, I was talking to some climate entrepreneurs just before, you're probably complementary and more so than you are competitive. Um, the biggest recommendation I give is if you want to beat the competition, be distribution day one focused. I'll give you an example. There's a really cool company called Fabric Health, not a portfolio company, Fabric Health. They're healthcare and they are set up shop in laundromats and they are helping plans reach the hardest to reach customers. That is a distribution vision. That is something that is a outlier idea that is highly effective as a competitive sword. Think about CAC. Think about all the things that people say, oh my God, it's so competitive. This is a company that's thinking about distribution differently. So that's typically what I would tend to focus on. Doesn't matter what sector, be distribution focused. All right, Saka, what do you think here? What do you, what advice do you give to portfolio companies when competitors happen? Yeah, so there's two to three different things. Uh, the first I'd say is, you want to keep a pulse on who your competitors are and what they're doing. 
Now, you can be manual and go to each of their websites every two or three weeks and try to see what their price point is and what's changed. That's very manual and it's time consuming. So if you can find automated ways and smart ways to keep tabs on who your competitors are and what they're doing, that'll save you a bunch of time and keep you close to the pulse so you don't lose ground to them. But the second thing is don't just look at competitors for competitors' sake. Your job at the end of the day is to focus on your customers, right? And how are your competitors solving for your customers' problems? I think it was Jeff Bezos that says, we don't even worry about competitors, we just focus on solving customer problems. A way to combine those two things is, if you go to Trustpilot and all these platforms, review platforms, and see what your competitors' uh, customers are saying about them using language models, GPT-3, whatever you want, you can actually create a word map and see what comes up when my customers are speaking about my competitors. Is it pricing that always comes up? Is it customer service is poor? What is coming up? That way you can know exactly what competitive advantage you can create to beat your competition and you know where your competition, competition is weak specifically. So those are two ways I'd advise founders to be aware of their competition and how to beat them without losing focus of who the customer is. Megan, advice on competitors. I would say, respectfully, Jeff Bezos built at a time when there were like 10 VC funds in Silicon Valley and 10% of people would even think about entrepreneurship. It is way more competitive these days. We're not in the good old days anymore. So I, I think hit the nail on the head always with your competitors. You're, the people you're pitching, your customers or your investors, know who they are. So the biggest red flag is when you're like, oh, we don't have any competition, or you deliberately leave one out of the map because for whatever reason. I think one of my favorite companies is based out of Company Ventures. It's called Uva. She's building a way better product using computer vision to test your biomarkers and your urine analysis. And there was a big competitor spending way more money, but the product was shit. And she went to a conference, a big femtech conference, where they were both presenting. And on all of the bathroom doors, there was her huge, what she's doing and what the competition is, why it was different from the competition. And I think that's amazing because everybody's asking that question. If you leave your customer meeting and you're like, they didn't mention how they're better than so-and-so, well, they're, like, they're going to ask everybody about it. So like, you might as well bring it up. It's a little contrarian. I don't know if I'm right about it, but I say, go for it. Talk about it. Plus yeah. one. Alana? Yeah, so I'm going to start with Pete. One thing you said I disagree with, you said most competitors are complementary, and I disagree. I think you're going to have a ton. I know you want to go back. A little bit of spin zone there, but. Yeah, like you're going to have a ton of competitors, and people who say that they don't have competitors haven't done their research. So you're going to have competitors, but I think you need to know your differentiating product. So why are you better than them, or how are you solving something that they're necessarily not solving? And so when I really help different uh, portfolio companies, I tell them first, go to market quick. You might not be the first person to go to market, that's fine. There was a MySpace before there was Facebook. There are gonna be other competitors in the market, but how are you gonna acquire those customers? What is your competitors missing that you might have? And then I'd really just say, I love companies that build in public. I think now in the day and age, we're so in public, you could get customer feedback so quickly. So I say get customer feedback as quickly as possible and in the early days be able to actually reiterate your product and make sure it's something that's really useful for your competitors not just something that you think fits but something that actually fits. all right so rebuttal you are good <laughs> rebuttal there's two reactions when you see a competitor one is what are they doing what are they doing oh they, what feature do they have oh, what, oh so there's that there's that bit where you fixate on what other peers are doing in an ecosystem the alternative reaction when you see a sub competitor is to say, I'm going to put the blinders on and talk to my customers and fixate on the customer. I think the temptation too much about fixating, especially early stage it, it, and to, to, just to creep on websites and, and look at, make word maps and things is to actually that you lose sight of the fact that you're actually not building a product in search of a pain point. You're, you're building a product that is in response to a pain point. And that's why I think it's more important, like the railroad analogy, to fixate on what the customer wants. You want to get from point A to point B. You don't care if you take an Amtrak or you take a Boeing. But the point is that you fixate on what the customer needs. Live voting is up. Gene, voting's up, correct? Okay, voting's up. Scan the QR code. Uh, I like the disagreements. 
I, I mean, I like for people to get along, but I like disagreements better. So you're doing a good job with that. A little bit of action. I'm a you know action type of guy. Anything else that we missed? Can I disagree that there were only ten venture funds when Jeff Bezos started? Oh, yeah. Oh. I think there was a few more than ten at that point in time. I just had to. Okay, fifteen maybe. I'll give you that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's just a point of disagreement. I'm petty sometimes. No, I'm kidding. It's okay. Um, the, the point is well made though, <laughs> because everybody is a startup founder. Everybody's a venture capitalist. So that is very very true. It's hyper competitive in that sense. And I'd like to say your emerging fund managers are more aligned with you than they ever have been because they're raising up funds too. They have to get, go out there and hustle and it sucks raising from LPs too. So we get it versus the big guys. And the results are, well, oh, there we go. Pete, congratulations. And Alana in second place again. Still, still looking good for the finals, though. It's all right. Scrappy. You can take this. It's fantastic. All right, good. A little bit of movement here. All right, now we're, it's not a popularity contest, which is good. And we're actually listening here. All right, great. Last question before we. Oh, Ooh, let's go. all right. Oh, now we're done. Does anybody want to just break the tie before we move on? Does anybody want to break the tie? If not, we'll move on. It's all right. It's fine, guys. It's fine. We'll move on. I'm not, we're not doing a tie for the finals. That's all I'm saying. All right, guys. All right, good. Fund and grow. Last question before we cut two of the VCs and get them uh, moved here. All right, so what's the most important skill set a team needs to have as they grow from pre-seed to seed or seed to A? What, what's the most important positions uh, to fill or hire to make a successful jump? Saka? Yeah, I'll kick this off. So. At a pre-seed stage, uh, I, I look at your goals, right? It, you need to create product market fit, which means you need to be able to get product market fit with specific skills. Number one, I'd say, is having the ability to rapidly test and deploy with your customers to see what they need and what's useful. So maybe UI, UX, the ability to code and make scrappy you know, MVPs and things of that nature. That's super important at the early stage. Um, number two, as well, when you're in that very early stage, is the ability to kind of fundraise, right? You need to be able to sell yourself. You need to be able to speak to people and things of that nature. And then as you move on to like a series A round, now you're talking about scale. I'd say what's really important here is number one, the ability to um, scale in an automated way. So put some systems, some processes in place so that you can get to where you're trying to get to. And then number two as well, is finance has become really important at this stage, right? You've raised a million, you've raised two million, whatever amount it is, now it's about can you uh, leverage this capital to the most effective way possible in order to grow your business? So do I have a good handle on my balance sheets and my income statement and what I'm spending money on and things of that nature? And then last but not least, I think this is when you start to hire. So your ability to network, to bring people on and, and let them buy into the vision, building a company culture, I think these are super important in this sort of Series A or post seed uh, round, in my opinion. Megan? So I'm going to talk about seed to Series A because I think pre seed to seed is a way more similar jump. And honestly, I think if you have an institutionally led pre seed, you're probably going to raise a seed. But as someone who models our fund model and tries to figure out, we're told benchmark only 50% of companies that you invested in seed are going to get to A. And that's crazy. And so that takes a lot of hustle to get to that next uh, benchmark. And everybody always talks about the million dollar number, whether it's a million users or a million in revenue to raise the A. But what I think you really need to prove at that point is that you have the velocity to scale, that you are ready if you raise a five to $15 million round, you're ready to go. And so usually that means shifting from an offshore dev shop to hiring engineers in house can you attract talent? Can you get people to leave their big jobs to come join you? And so that and also marketing of once you raise this big round, are you going to be able to spend efficiently to acquire customers? Um, I, typically up to the A, I would say it's a lot of founder-led sales is usually what I look for. And at this point, you're going to have to hire out and, and uh, delegate tasks that otherwise you've been doing probably in-house. And so that's the big move. Alana. 
Yeah, so I don't know if anybody has watched 60 Seconds Startup from Alex Lieberman, who co-founded Morning Brew. But it's really interesting, because one of his questions is, what's the scrappiest thing that you've ever done as a founder? And so kind of up to that first question, it's like, what do you think is the most important quality of a founder? And it's scrappiness. Like, you are just starting off. Nobody knows who you are. It's not easy to get customers. I think, like, sometimes you have to do things that you wouldn't necessarily do. I mean, I know people who have stock VCs offices up to going to customers on the street and asking them to try their product to get feedback. Like, do whatever you have to do, and it's not easy. And nobody said it was easy or else everybody would be a founder. But I think that's something that in the beginning, you kind of have to be like, no shame. I will do whatever it takes to get some feedback and get this product launched. Um, in terms of hiring, I would say in the beginning and especially in the pre-seed, it's important to either have a technical co-founder, know somebody who knows how to at least make your product, especially if it's technical. Um, and then the once you go kind of that seed to Series A, I think it's sales. I think if you can't sell products, you're going to have no revenue, you're going to have no customers, and in turn you're not going to be able to build anything because you don't really know if you're solving a problem. So I've always seen the importance of, I mean, you see, like Adam um, from WeWork, and he was able to sell you anything. Like he could come up here and sell you this microphone, and you're like, why the hell do I need it? And so I think if you're able to have a good sales team, then you're able to really just succeed. Pete, we miss anything here? Ilana nailed it with the S word, scrappy. <laughs> there was a, a lot of other attributes that were mentioned here. Scrappy is also a fancy word for uh, for doing everything you can to get in front of new customers. In other words, when you're very, very early, whether you want product market fit or you want your first customer, it's a lot of cold calling. I mean, there's a lot of very just matter of fact things that you need to do. So at the seed stage, that attribute, that skill set is it needs to evolve by, by the series A. And how does it need to evolve? Actually, I like the word that Saka used. You need to find a way to scale the go-to market. So you go from scrappy to scale the go-to market. That really means you, you're you're not just being the one that relies on your own charisma, not just the one that's writing the personalized emails to a dozen founders when you're late at night, because that doesn't scale. And so the the key attribute that I that I at least look for is is definitely the scrappiness and a effective sales motion, but a overture or an ability to actually to, to scale that, that go to market. Let's put the QR code up. We'll get the final votes before we get to the finals. Uh, I will note that we don't condone stalking unless it's with VCs, so it's okay. Um, anything else that, you know, this is like your final call. Some Two of you won't make it. Uh, anything else that we want to say? I just think tenacity is super important. I don't know if it's a skill or something you're born with. You can debate that. But having that grit to get through those tough days in the early stages is important because you have to be able to see the light before anyone else does, before you have your first customer, before you find product market fit. So grit and tenacity through all that happens, I think, is a skill that's super important. Professor, I think you asked what you need to hire for, not what the yes, founder needs. I would love to hear that. Well, I was, I'm just saying, I hope the founder's scrappy and resilient, but I'm talking about like what they need to hire for outside of them to get to that next. I'm gonna make a general comment. We are not prophets or oracles. It is easy to sort of be up here and opine about what you need to do. And, and I, I just underscore here that, that our job is to see the future before anybody else, not to predict it. So thank you guys for being here. And nobody knows your job better than you. And that was not a ploy for votes. You guys, <laughs> really? Jeez. Well, most of the votes are in our not so, pandering. Yes, <laughs> nice try. Let's. Why I haven't said anything. So. Yeah. Let's uh, let's bring up the vote total. Gene's gonna give us the total of who's going who's gonna make the finals. But this is just for Alana crushed this round. Looks like she's making the finals. I'm just guessing. I don't know yet. I'm gonna get a text from Gene. Where he's talented up votes. He's in Excel. He's, he's like a wizard over there. It's amazing. But uh, you guys definitely took a risk by being in the middle uh, because if you don't make it, you're going to have to move. That's going to be embarrassing for everybody. But it's, it's all right. It's okay. We're going to have a lot of good content to reshare. Everyone get on Twitter, Primetime VC. Uh, 
Follow Primetime VC. We'll have all this content distributed. The top two are Sokka. Sokka has made the final. Sokka. Round of applause for Sokka. Sokka. And Alana has made the final. So we're doing a seat switch here. We're doing a seat switch. I'm sorry. This is the unlucky microphone. So sorry. that's going to be challenging. Listen, you two could still chime in with some good banter, some big comments. But you didn't make the finals. Sorry, you didn't make the finals. We're going to do drinks downstairs afterwards, too. So stick around if you guys want to come downstairs. You guys could pitch them. We'll do that, too. But it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so we are in the finals. This is exciting. Where's my finals questions? I don't even know. All right, finals. Cap tables. Cap tables can be tricky. Adding new investors, dealing with attorneys, evaluating compensa compensation equity uh, for employees. There's a lot of different factors into that. What's the most important thing to know or to evaluate when building out your cap table? Alana, start us off. Yeah, I think the most important thing to know when you're building out your cap table is the investors on your cap table. I think a lot of times when companies are raising money, they just think, okay, I need to raise money. I need it in the door. I'm running out of runway. And I think you don't really ask, like, what can the investors do for you? Like this whole time we've been telling you kind of what you need to do for us to make us money. And it's like, but you're also taking the funds in the expectation. They're taking an ownership percentage in your company and you're hoping that they believe in your vision. So I'd say when you're building out your cap table, really know the investors, know the value that they could bring to you and don't just take anybody. You're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. And I just think that's really an important fact that people forget. Sako, what do you think here? Yeah, I think in addition to that, it's super important to look at who owns what and what percentage, especially the founders. How much have they been, been diluted by what stage? Because if you have a founder that's given away 60% of his company by the time you get to Series A, he's not going to be that incentivized to stay and you know really grow this for the long term. So looking at dilution and how that's changed over time on the cap table is super important. Uh, I think the second thing as well on the cap table to look at is how many shares or how big is the option pool that you've reserved as well? Because if, if that's an afterthought for you, um, then I have some bad news for you. As time goes on and that pool gets smaller and smaller, you have less to offer employees to bring talent on. So if, if I can see a cap table that has enough um, shares reserved for employees, I'm thinking that, wow, they've planned for the future. They know they can hire a great VP of marketing down the line that can offer them 2 or 3% to whatever it is to really hook them and bring them onto the, to, to the, to the team. So I, I think of those things. So we're going to hold off on voting to the very last question. Um, but anything we missed from our... I would just say a lot of founders don't realize there's a 99 LP limit. So make sure with all like the preeminence of party rounds these days, you can only have 99 LPs. And then also understand how, if you have a bunch of safes and convertible notes, how those are gonna convert into your next round and how much equity you're gonna have. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Cause I think that actually is a really important point. There are something called syndicates or SPVs. So that's how we kind of started off where really we pool money together from accredited investors. So you can invest, our minimum amount is 1K. We use AngelList and so we pull together like 50 LPs, and then we invest through one check. And so that's only one check on the cap table. And I just think that's important just for anybody who is a founder looking to raise money, but also if you're an investor and you're looking at starting your angel portfolio, you could really go on AngelList, subscribe to different syndicates and be able to invest. And there isn't that limit. I'll just add, so post SVB, there's a new cool kid uh, on the cap table, which is the investors who are very good at exit. A lot of times you're looking for investors who are very good at product, very good at hiring, but exit is a new competency. So strategics, you used to scan a cap table and see a strategic and you're like, oh my God, a strategic investor. Oh no. Now it's a little bit more, you're more amenable to, to seeing that. Being good at exit is a good thing to have on a cap table. Nice. Mm -hmm. Moving on. You mentioned SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. <laughs> Something happened in the news uh, and I'm curious of what role did VCs play in the SVB debacle? Uh, and what are the long-term effects on startups raising capital? Uh, Saka. Uh, yeah, well, what role they played depended on what they tweeted that day, to be honest. Um, some of them <laughs> tweeted out that you should run for the door and you should get out as quickly as possible. 
other VCs tweeted that, hey, you might be struggling with SVB, but I found a way to, to help you migrate to another bank and get you a credit facility to make payroll next week or whatever it is. So I think there were two camps in terms of uh, VCs and what role they played. They were either on, I guess, the side of the founder or they were just kind of scaring everyone half to death. Um, the impact it's going to have on the industry, I think there are two to three key points. Um, the first is there's going to be somewhat of uh, an onus on founders to now mitigate risk a bit more. So you can't just have one bank account. You might need to have three or four different accounts, right? Because you're not sure who's going to fail. And that brings in operational complexity, right? I have three different checking accounts I need to manage. I need to do X, Y, and Z. It's just more operational complexity. The other thing I think that, that's there as well is, you know, there's a bit of a credit shrinkage that's happening right now. So with Silicon Valley Bank, who is a trusted player going downhill, you know, other banks are going to be a bit nervous about extending credit or not. And then people, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on them as well. So I think those are two potential effects. Yeah. So I think there was two sides of SCB. There was the funds, which had their funds on it. We had um, about $8 million on it from our last capital call. And then there was the portfolio companies who, had, who couldn't even make payroll the next week because they couldn't get their funds out. And so what role did VCs play? Well, VCs were scared. Um, I don't know if this will like lose me a belt, but I tweeted out on Thursday being like, we're taking our funds off of SVB and <laughs> I would do the same. Like, I'm not going to say we're taking off on our end. We're messaging all our portfolio companies without kind of saying, like, this is something that's serious. At least take out enough money to be able to pay for payroll within the next week. And I just think that's really important. So do I think we played a role? Yes, 100%. I think VCs played a huge role from internal messages to Twitter to social. And your second question was... Which uh, long-term effects startups raising capital? Oh, I think it's going to have a huge effect. If you really look at what percentages of startups use SEB, not only for banking, but to actually acquire funds and taking out loans. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was way over 50%. I thought it was closer to 75. And so this is just going to really affect the innovation of the future because these companies will no longer be able to get a line of credit and be able to build at the earliest stage because a lot of banks are going to be really hesitant to loan out money. So I think it's going to be interesting to see. I think other players are going to have to come in or they're going to have to get really scrappy with their money and find other ways to raise money at the earliest stage. But I think it's going to be hard and I can't, I'm hopeful that something else will happen for them to be able to really raise capital. Okay. For the sake of uh, time, we're going to move on to the third question here. Uh, chat GPT rules. I'm sure you guys have all played around with it. It's pretty cool. Uh, might take over the world like Skynet in Terminator, but that's, you know, <laughs> it's down the line. We got some time to play with it. Uh, what's the most interesting new job or skill set that will be born out of chat GPT era uh, that companies will pay big money for? S Alana. Yeah, interesting. Um, so you showed me this question for, I sat down in the intro and looked up and asked ChatGBT what jobs will be most interesting that they'll take cheating. away. I didn't like the responses. <laughs> so I was like, these are awful. They're like mundane tasks. I'm like, well, none of that's exciting and fun or they're like a data scientist. But what I think is really interesting is I actually went with my friend and we were playing a card game and we we're like, wow, this is so fun. And it was like, sitting around a table to get to know everybody. And it's like, what interesting questions can you ask to the people around our table? We really went back that night and we're like, you know what, let's ask ChatGPT to take a hundred questions and like write them out. So what are a hundred interesting questions to ask the table? And then we're like, okay, help me build a website to put in HTML to be able to build out this website so that you really click a button and it says like, ask a question and it comes out with the output. And so I think this is just a small way, but it's gonna be able to help like build designs, build out websites. And I'm super excited. I use it almost every day, so. Absolutely. I think there's gonna be a new job called a prompt engineer. A prompt engineer is someone who knows how to ask the right questions into GPT-3 or 4 to get a specific or a, a contextual answer. So the ability to ask it questions um, such as, you know, I'm going on vacation at this time and I'm looking for weather at, the, you know, at this temperature point or whatever it is, asking the best question gives you the best results. The garbage in, garbage out. Has anyone heard of that term, right? Um, all right, I'm dating myself there. Um, but that's one kind of aspect I think that's going to that's gonna flourish, a prompt engineer. And the other skill set as well is people are going to want chat GPT-3 for their own internal purposes. Right now, I just ask the World Wide Web. 
but I want an internal chat GPT-3 for my company, right? So can I ask um, someone in HR how I can get reimbursed for whatever it is, right? Without having to send them a Slack message or things of that nature. So whoever can create um, systems or web uh, workflows that can, can help businesses create their own internal chat GPT, I think is gonna be an amazing skill to have and you can really monetize that. So we're gonna open up the voting. The QR code's gonna come up. Um, Pete, Megan, do you have any answers to the chat GPT or? Yeah, I mean, the question was about where will people spend a lot of money? The company spent a ton of money on KYC, on, on Know Your Customer. It's just, you have to for compliance and all that. I, I feel like there it, there will be something to the effect of a Know Your Prompt or a K, KYP. Why? I don't think this is important, like who enters it. It's actually more important for the companies who utilize this to actually make sure that whatever they're putting out there uh, is either accurate or uh, somehow in compliance. So I think it, it, there's going to be a ton of money spent on the audit sort of space. Megan? Less fun answer, but founders are not cash managers. I don't think you should have three to four different bank accounts and be managing between them to make payroll every two weeks. You should have your debt somewhere. You should have different banks are used for different things. But, I mean, if you're with J.P. Morgan, First Republic, some of the top banks, you're going to be fine. And you don't need to have $200,000 in five different banks just to make it. So before we show you the answers, we do have like five more minutes or so. And we had an extra question. So why don't we just go down the line in the, in the, in the general question of bringing back everybody with this is share your best startup analogy for success, best advice, or best story of a startup resilience. But Pete, why don't you give us a, a pump-up speech for the crowd? All right, oh, pump-up speech. So I come from a touring rock background, like hard-hitting touring. And we had, at one point, a huge show in New York. It, it was a, ma a massive success. Next night, we played in Delaware in a dive bar. And the band playing before us, the, the crowd just sifted out. And it was just the four of us playing on stage, bartender and her dog sitting there. The bartender went out for a smoke break and we were playing our hearts hearts out to a beagle. Uh, I mentioned that because there, there's like, when you're in the trenches, there's that founder journey where you're like, bam, bottom of the barrel. And that's, if I can only say that, that that word Alana used, scrappy, that let that be your North Star and unexpected and good things can come. Saka, you got a story uh, you want to share for startups? Yeah, well, there's an analogy that came to mind that I thought was obscure, but kind of relevant. Someone said that being a founder um, is, is interesting because it's kind of like having a child. So having a startup is like having a child. And I'm like, what do you mean? That's, that's a weird way to put it. And he said, well, there are three things. The first is um, the child or startup op often imbibes the values of the founder, right? I'm like, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. The second thing they mentioned was that oftentimes you don't see the results immediately, right? You only see the results in 10, 15 years' time. If you're raising a kid or you're you know, founding a startup, you see the results in, over time. And then last but not least, he said that everything can go to crap pretty quickly. And I was like, yeah, okay, that kind of applies. So, um, yeah, that was an interesting analogy that I, I heard and uh, never really saw anywhere else, but yeah. All right, fair enough. Alana, analogy or startup story that you want to share before we uh, take off? Yeah, um, I think one time uh, we had a party, we host a lot of events throughout it, and we had one for our venture fund. And in the syndicate, we're able to do things outside of Web3 crypto. So we had a consumer product. And really, they came to the party. They're a vegan alternative food. They came with their product for us to try to give out in hopes that eventually we will invest. And this is just a stupid story, but just goes to show that they really carried around this vegan type of egg the whole entire time just to have us try it. And it was pretty good. But I think it just shows like you always have to be ready and go out of your way. And even if people say no, try again. A lot of people like keep VCs who said no. They call them sometimes the ha-ha list and they'll continue to send out updates and emails to let them know what they're doing. And a lot of times we as VCs will say no one time, but then see them build and see them acquire customers and then we'll look at them again. So I just say like, don't take no as a no forever, but keep trying and it might work out. All right, Megan? Yeah, I have an entrepreneur. I'm not going to name him because I don't want to out his story, but 
he flew to Chicago to meet his co-founder, and essentially they were going to call it after working on this company for two years. Friday, they sent out like a million cold emails to everybody, just like a last-ditch attempt. But Sunday, he got back on a plane to New York and was like, it's over, like, definitely. Monday morning in his inbox, Alexis Ohanian was like, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. Let's get on the phone. Two days later, he was leading the round, ended up being like a $10 million, crazy, amazing round. And all that is to say is all it takes is one. It's just momentum. And so even if like always go for that last ditch attempt, even if you hear a lot of no's, all you need is one yes. All right, all right. Uh, moment of truth, uh, Nahal, uh, Nadal. So I'm used to having Nahal here. Uh, Nadal, can you show the uh, the winner? And we we're gonna give you the belt, and you're gonna have it. Uh, you're going to. Oh, there we go, Alana. There we go. Woo take the belt, Alana. Take the stage, take a speech. Uh -oh. You got to speak. Yeah, you got to give you a gotta speech. Stand up, do a speech. It's like you know tradition. I think we just said our motivational speech. You got you to put the picture. Is it? Right there. There it is. I did that on purpose because yes. I knew I was going to win. No. Um, I just think for any founders out there, like you're going to get told no. And I think that's what all of us were just saying right now. It's like, you've got to keep trying. I mean, me as a venture person, like I came from a sales background. I have my CPA, I was doing consulting and the way I did it was I just started investing. And then I started finding companies that were really exciting to me. And I brought them different venture funds and eventually was brought in a venture and it sounds easier than it was. But I just say, like, if there's something that you know that you really want to do, like, fight for it. And nothing's going to be handed to you. And nothing handed to you is easy. So I just say, keep trying and fight your way. And things have a way of working out. So thanks. All right, awesome. A round of applause.